my experience, my expertise. So I want to uh, share with you that we discussed rooms division. We talked about the rooms being the highest profit revenue generating area because it had the least expenses. Housekeeping and maintenance or engineering are not revenue generating areas, they're expense. They cost you to maintain and operate the rooms that you're selling to get revenue. And we discussed that. So in rooms division, you basically have to forecast and discuss how many rooms in your budget you feel you're gonna sell at that point in period of time based on the rooms that are available. So it's the least expensive, but the highest profitable revenue area. Food and beverage is the opposite. Food and beverage is the most expensive area and the least revenue generating area, if not managed correctly, it has smaller margins. And that's why in our industry, hoteliers or restaurateurs hire the most experienced food and beverage people, because if they don't, they'll lose a lot of money very quickly. So food and beverage uh, director is a manager. And if it's called director of operations, that's just a larger resort or a larger hotel with many food and beverage outlets or retail outlets that sell food and beverage. So you might go into some large establishments and hotels that have coffee shops, delis, quick stores or convenience stores where people can buy quick beverages, grab and go sandwiches and those type of uh, items, which are all managed by the food and beverage department. So the director of food and beverage is the person that manages or oversees the whole department. They're a manager that reports directly to the general manager, or if there's an assistant GM or a director of operations, they report directly to that person. So they oversee all of the kitchen functions, all of the chefs, the executive chef, the catering and banquet managers. They would be at an equal line with the executive sales manager who reports directly to the general manager. And the sales manager is a person that works with all teams in generating revenue and sales for rooms division, food and beverage, catering and banquets. So if you have multiple restaurants, the food and beverage director would oversee those. And then under the food and beverage director, you would have restaurant managers, assistant restaurant managers, supervisors, and there would be a chain of command and a job description for each individual in the restaurants, in the food outlets. And then you would have an executive chef and then the kitchen, and the kitchen would have their hierarchy, um, sous chef, line cooks, pantry cooks, pastry cooks, and then uh, um, they would answer to the executive chef and then the executive chef would report to the food and beverage uh, director. Uh, so then you have your banquet, your banquet manager would report to the catering and sales manager, the banquet manager would be responsible for all banquets and they would have their banquet captains which are leads, leads which would manage a team of servers and the servers would be responsible for various events. Then you would have a beverage manager if you're a large hotel or operation and the beverage manager reporting to that individual would be all the bartenders, the bar backs, anyone that has to do with um, the bar business. Some hotels have nightclubs. One hotel that I managed, we had a very large nightclub where bands would come and play and we'd have 450 to 500 people in that nightclub on a Friday and Saturday night. So I had a large department of bank uh, banquet bartenders. I had uh, the um, venue bartenders, the restaurant bartenders that all answered to a beverage manager. And any given night, we would have 10 bartenders on staff throughout the property because we had many events and the nightclub, which ran off late evening into early in the morning. All these individuals do report to the food and beverage operations manager. The food and beverage operations uh, manager would be responsible for the budget and the fiscal management of all these areas in these departments working with uh, their team. Profit margins uh, here, it says 25 to uh, 30%. 
Uh, well, it's not that uh, exact. Uh, most margins are really close. Uh, they're like uh, 3% if you're making a profit. And I'll explain that to you. Okay. Um, the executive chef in large operations, as you know, there are many training facilities, uh, community colleges, there are culinary schools, world renowned culinary schools. So the experience of the chef and the title of the chef depends on the size of the property. Large hotels and resorts, the executive chef is more of a management person than a cook. They will do large um, percentages of labor costs, food costs, working with the purchasing agent to purchase and buy food, writing menus, uh, working with guests and clients to write um, specialty catering menus. So it's not a person that necessarily works on the line as a cook, but again, it depends on the size of the resort or the property. Some of the smaller properties, the executive chef could be what we call a working chef that does all of what I mentioned, but is responsible for the daily operations off the line. In a large resort, the executive chef will have many sous chefs. There might even be a title of an executive sous chef whose sous chefs fall underneath. Um, some hotels, they even have chefs that all they do is budgets and fiscal management, where they just do labor cost or food cost, or they just work on the finances. That's how large some of these resorts are. Okay. Um, so they're responsible for all the efficiency and operations of all kitchens. Some hotels have more than one kitchen. You might see banquet kitchens, you might see individual restaurant kitchens, or you might see one large kitchen where it's divided into sections where different parts of restaurants or grab and go areas work from the one uh, kitchen. It depends on the size and how the operation is designed. Some executive chefs might have dual roles where they might be a kitchen manager or even some operations. An executive chef is also the food and beverage director. So they do both jobs. And this is just for smaller properties that want to save uh, on large labor expenses in the executive management position. So the executive chef might not have a large bar business. They might have one bar and then a few bars in the banquet and they would be able to manage those operations along with the kitchen duties and responsibilities. So uh, again, they're managing the bottom line and the margin, which our largest expense in food and beverage is labor. So labor is managed. Labor and food costs are considered variable expenses. And on um, Wednesday, we're going to talk about finances and fiscal management. And we'll discuss this a little bit further. Variable expenses are expenses that fluctuate with sales. What this means is that if I have a lot of sales, I'm going to need to purchase more food, more liquor, and I have more labor. And so I hire more people. But if I have minimal sales, I'm going to hire less people. And I don't need to purchase as much food. I don't need to purchase as much liquor. So variable means that labor, food, and liquor vary with the sales or the revenue that I generate. The opposite of variable is fixed expenses. Fixed expenses do not fluctuate with sales. This is your rent, your utilities, uh, any leases you have on vehicles or equipment. You can lease cookware, dish machines, anything in the kitchen can be leased. Uh, so we take these and we uh, figure the, which I'm gonna get into on Wednesday, the food cost, and labor cost and the beverage cost is figured into the revenue to determine a percentage of cost, which determines our margin. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on Wednesday. So when we figure uh, the management and the fiscal management of the budget, labor cost is one of our higher expenses. The executive chef manages their budget and the labor in the kitchen. The food and beverage director manages the executive chef and watches over the labor, manages the beverage, manages the restaurant managers and watches over their labor. And as we discussed in one of our earlier lectures, we talked about how the point of sale system, POS system, um, people can log in to the PO point of sale system. So they time in or clock in or clock out through the POS system and the POS system manages the labor cost 
through the daily sales or revenue, which is posted through the point of sales when a server or a bartender posts a, a bill or a tab on the point of sales system. So they can run daily reports through the point of sales system on an hourly basis, shift. You could do a breakfast shift, a lunch shift, a dinner. You could look at your labor. You can also look at your forecast based on the res reservations. Um, so uh, you base it on the number of open table talks to point of sales. So most open table is a reservation system that's used by the industry. It's a membership. You join it, you pay a member due, but it's a software system that speaks to most point of sale system. And it's a reservation system. So you can do your for labor forecast, meaning your schedule based on the reservations for that evening through open table which is a shared partnership with another software company. And OpenTable will have your specific restaurant diagram on their website. It'll have your menu on their website. It'll have your hours of operation. You can manage it as a food and beverage manager with any special events or holidays coming up. It'll automatically do your booking and reservations for you. You do pay a monthly fee. Most establishments do use this because you don't have to call in anymore like the old days where you call in and you book a reservation. And we used to keep what we call the captain's log where the manager on duty would take notes and take reservations right at the um, host stand. We don't do that anymore. It's all done now through a software system electronically. So we can keep track of our forecast of how many staff we need on hand based on our reservations. Okay, the brigade system is that was established, which you're gonna learn in professional cooking by George Augustus Scaffier who was the founder of the modern brigade system. So classically, a classic kitchen had a chef for every station in the kitchen. And a station chef was called a chef de partie, partie uh, chef. And then they used the French term, pantry cook or pantry chef was garmagee, pastry cook or pastry chef was patissier, uh, sous in French means under chef or sous chef. Um, you had a butcher, you had a um, charcuterie, which is a pork cook, which did all the butchering and the pork. So you had all these different positions. But in today's modern kitchen, based on labor, we have to have what's called a modern system. And that's where we use the term kitchen manager. Kitchen manager would manage stations or station cooks. If you're not formally trained, they would go through a training uh, session or a learning session on the preparation of the menu items. And this is where a lot of your quick service type places, um, train people like Chipotle Grill, Taco Bell, Chick-fil-A, all of them train their people. And these are the type of uh, kitchen management systems that you see in place. So a hotel could have many restaurants, as we said. Chains could have regional restaurants. You could have regional chefs. You could have a regional corporate chef, or you could have a corporate chef that's in charge of a whole hotel chain. So restaurant managers oversee all the operations, quality of service, hiring and training, uh, labor costs, scheduling, budgets. So the food and beverage director would have their part of the budget, which would be part of the executive management overall budget and strategy. And then they, he would work or she would work with their team and their team would get part of that budget, meaning the executive chef would get their part restaurant managers would have theirs, the bar or beverage manager would have theirs, and they'd all work together, creating one final budget that would go to the um, executive committee who would determine the final budget. Um, so the budget is worked together as a team. It's based on forecasting of revenue and sales. Forecast is a history. And you take a look at the past history of what your sales is, and you try to increase them and you base it on a percentage of increased forecast to generate revenue. In some large hotels, room service is part of the operation. Uh, Chloe Landing, our room service, we had to actually set up the golf carts that had hot and cold boxes on them, and they would be delivered to rooms. They would have to drive around the resort. So we had special people that were assigned to that. And again, it was done through the telephone app or the room app on the TV. People would simply put the order in. They didn't necessarily have to call the restaurant. They would go right to an app. They would place the order. 
and then the order was automatically delivered. You're seeing this now with uh, curbside service in restaurants. They now have an app where you do not call the restaurant per se and say, I want to place a takeout or pickup order. You go to an app, you put your order in, it's automatically prepared, and they give you a time, a text message, or an email when you can come and pick up your food. The same works with large re resorts and hotels. Communication now is done through mobile apps. And again, you have to forecast the number of guests that you feel are going to stay in the hotel, the number of guests that you feel are going to stay on property to eat in the hotel, and the number that you feel would eat in each various establishment. And there are industry standards and norms that we use, which I'll share with you on Wednesday's lecture. And there's also a history that you have to take of that um, hotel. So at dinner time, many of your guests prefer to eat off property at other locations, or they may be out and about exploring the community or on boat trip or scuba diving trips or snorkeling trips or away from the property, or they might be part of a convention where they're at a convention center, but the events held at another adjoining hotel or at the convention center, so they're not staying on property. And you'll know this from the food and beverage meetings that you would have when the catering sales department goes over all of the BEOs, the banquet and event order forms at each meeting. So we determine how many guests would stay on property, how many guests would be off property. And again, it's based on history, forecast, or any event that's going on. So for example, um, many of us watched yesterday the uh, football championship, American Conference and the National League Conference which is going to be the Super Bowl, which is going to be held in LA. So all the hotels in LA around uh, the uh, stadium, Spot Loan Stadium, are going to uh, up their forecast. They're going to be sold out. They're going to have events. They're going to have everything that has to do with sporting, equipment, gear, telecommunications, anyone to do with them staying in their hotels. There's going to be meetings, there's going to be sales meetings, there's going to be people wanting and dining, they're going to be booked. So they're going to forecast accordingly. Well, next year at this same time, there won't be a Super Bowl there. So their forecast will have to change. So they'll have a meeting and they'll say there's no venue, there's no event, and all of it will be taken off the budget and they'll estimate a normal business. So that's all part of forecasting and that's what's called history. Okay, so we're gonna talk about beverage bar costs uh, individually. Some hotels are so large, they have chief stewards. Stewards are sanitation engineers that report directly to the executive chef and the food and beverage. Um, some hotels are so large that the stewards count out the china and silver for every event. When I was in a convention center and we needed 10,000 plates, they had to count the plates. They had to label each plate rack of how many plates were in that rack. If you have a hotel that has different designs, the designs go to different restaurants, they have to be sorted and um, kept together. You have china, you have teapots, coffee pots, you have all your side work, sideware. All this has to be managed and the chief stewards take care of all of that to, in addition to all the sanitation of all venues. So it's a huge responsibility. Most chief stewards today, you try to have a bilingual individual uh, or an individual that's familiar with the work uh, style and ethics of those people in that hotel. Catering works directly and closely with the um, food and beverage department. The catering manager works with the food and beverage person but does not report to F&B. They report directly to the sales department and the sales manager. The banquet captains and the banquet manager do report to the F&B director and the catering manager. So it's a dotted line to both. Uh, this can get tricky at times. Um, many times they get different directives and direction from the F&B director and the catering and sales manager. So you have to really have a close relationship with them. And there are different banquet captains and banquet leads that specialize in different events. For example, you might have a banquet captain that's really strong in weddings setting up weddings, working with brides, and that's the person that you would appoint to those type of event. Remember the term is BEO, banquet event order form. 
We use these in hotels. They're electronic. They get printed out on a weekly basis. Each department has them. It's based on the events for that day. You have a large food and beverage meeting. You just discuss them every week. So catering includes many venues. And remember, we discussed that rooms division tries to work with the sales department and they sell rooms for large events. We call this room blocks. The reason why they do that is they want to sell food and beverage and on-site venue and property and events to these large groups generating higher revenue. So we're not a hotel or a property that want a lot of walk-ins uh, because then it's just like a restaurant. We have to base our forecast on the number of people that walk in unless we're a travel destination on the highway where we know at the evening we might have 100% of people because of traveling on the highway to get to a certain destination. But a large catering or conference center, we wanna book rooms, block the rooms and sell catering to all those blocked rooms. So director of catering is a very difficult job. It's a 24 seven type job on call as food and beverage. I was at home as a director of food and beverage and director of operations. I was constantly getting texts and phone calls from staff members. It's just a, it's a very demanding job, but it can be also financially lucrative because many jobs you have a base pay and you negotiate a bonus. All executive positions like executive chef, catering manager, director of food and beverage, and even restaurant managers negotiate a uh, bonus package. And that's common in our industry. It's not uncommon. It's a known fact. BEO, know that term. Be familiar with that because you're going to be working in uh, any, any position you're in in a hotel, you're going to be working in BEOs, banquet event orders. It affects all departments in the hotel, including engineer and housekeeping. It, is, it communicates to all departments what a special group or venue needs or what they're ordering. Menu, food, beverage, in-room placements, which could be gifts, it could be wine, it could be cheese, it could be you have to put special invites in the room. It could be certain people that are CEOs of an event that want things in the room, how it's all set up. Um, there are certain events where you're working with an event manager for a CEO and they have special requests. And this is where your event manager, you might appoint someone that's strictly working just with that event. Because as I told you, the one event that I did in Hawaii was $350,000 a week event with Sony. And um, we had, I worked directly just with their event manager. And then I learned there's a more than one event manager. There's a couple for different venues that happened on the, the island. So they may want a room set up, a room design. So the executive chef might have to work with the event manager in designing special menus. They might have to work with the banquet manager and the F and B director on how they want the room set up. Many venues that I did, we had ice carving displays. We had little theme cafes set up in the room that looked like bistros or pizzerias or pasta stations or seafood uh, boats and those type of things that they want set up where we would have people shucking oysters or um, doing various uh, dishes that would represent the theme of that venue. So a lot of companies spend a lot of money. People have dress up galas, dress up parties, theme parties that you have to work with them on setting up the event in the banquet room. And you're gonna have your porters, porters are banquet event people that set up the rooms. They move the chairs, they move the tables, they set up the displays. And the porters report directly to the banquet managers or the captains. Captains are responsible for each individual banquet or event, and they report directly to the banquet manager. And these are for large hotels, large resorts, and country clubs that do large events and venues. So when you have a catered event, at the time they sign the contract, 50% of the deposit is due. At the time, the guarantee, you guarantee the number of guests that are going to attend 72 hours before 100% of the, the check is paid. That means you have all cash in hand before the event starts. This is why 
your large hotels, your large catering venues want to do a lot of catered events or they want to do a lot of banquets because in a restaurant, you have to wait for walk-ins. You have to say how many guests are coming in to eat at the restaurant, how many reservations we have. Well, in a catered event, you know months in advance what type of party you're going to have and the number of people that are going to attend the event. 72 hours, you have 100% guaranteed and paid for who's going to attend that event and it's paid for. So if guests don't show up and the guarantee is 150 and they pay for 150, and only 125 show up, you don't give money back to the, to the venue. They're paid for. That 150 is guaranteed. It's paid for. They guaranteed 150. Um, you don't give them food back. It doesn't work that way. That's to guarantee uh, the costs and expenses for the hotel. So they prepped sufficiently. They had enough food. They had enough for large events. They have enough for no shows. And um, policy is three to five percent. Some hotels it could be as large as ten percent over count. Catering sales manager. That is different than a catering or banquet manager. They work in the sales department. They're the one that are selling the event. It's different than a rooms sales person. Under the sales manager, you have a whole catering sales team that all they do is sell F and B. And you have also rooms division. All they do is block and sell rooms. They work closely together. Some large convention centers have managers or event managers that are assigned to different corporations. Like you might have a pharmaceutical company that does events all year and you have one person just assigned to that pharmaceutical company because of the amount of revenue they generate throughout the year. This is not uncommon in the hospitality industry. So they're responsible for directing all the service of all the large events and the functions. Okay. Okay, so you have to determine what type of hotel you are to determine what type of food venue you are. So what we're discussing are large convention centers or conference centers that, or resorts, which we have here in Palm Beach County that have many restaurants and many outlets. If you're a travel destination on the highway, like a Hampton Inns, they don't have large food service. They do the buffets, breakfast buffet in the morning, and that's it. And uh, no one's there in the afternoon. The hotel's empty until people check in at night. So most people only stay for two nights, the most three, but most people are just traveling through, they get the breakfast buffet, they pack and they leave and they're gone the next night. But the occupancy rate is almost 100% because it's on a highway, it's a travel destination. And these, most of these are economy hotels, they're mid-sized, they, a lot of them cut back on the food and beverage, they all used to offer, like a courtyard used to have full service restaurants. Some still do. A lot of them went to vending machines and the small buffets because of labor costs. It costs money to keep people on staff. So if you had a restaurant and at lunchtime, you had no guests because guests are in their cars, they're, they're traveling. And a courtyard wasn't known for serving, you know, high quality food unless the restaurant was leased out by someone. So they did away and they went into vending machines or just the buffet in the morning and vending machines in the afternoon. It saved on labor cost. And the revenue is made in the rooms division. A lot of these hotels, you're seeing the general managers are the same people that are the front desk or front end manager. That's the same person that greets you and might even be when you go down to get your extra towels or linen, it's the same person. And that's because they're saving in labor. There are some challenges in these properties. If a uh, manager needs time off or if they don't have uh, depth in their staffing, um, you know, people aren't going to stay um, you know, to, uh, there as a destination resort. So they're gonna lose, could lose money with the food and beverage. A lot of your hotels now you'll see in the same parking lot as huge, um, with a lot of restaurants like Texas Roadhouse or um, various restaurants in the parking area or Waffle House or Bob Evans and then they share um, uh, the destination travel with the revenue so they're full in the hotel but the restaurants are busy also and that's why people stay there okay
Okay. So 